Brent Fresh from SEC Media Days uh, from a week ago where we were able to catch up. Always great. Spend some time with Brent Beard. Brent, have you fully recovered from that trip uh, <laughs> yeah. to Hoover? Brent, well, uh, Trav, we left on uh, Thursday night after our friend Mark McLeod uh, did his show around six o'clock. So we got we got in bed about four Friday morning, but uh, it was great to see you and everybody from the station who were the who were there and they, they, it was uh, uh, it, it was not it was a good week we enjoyed that immensely and I'll throw in on your duets now we are one month away today from the first game with Florida and Miami and I, now people wouldn't think about this much but uh, I'm, if they get, if they get some help from their offensive line uh, I Felipe Franks and either Tyree Cleveland or Van Jefferson could be a pretty good duet uh, this year in the league. And, and uh, again, we still have questions, obviously, about Felipe Franks. But um, uh, but but if if he gets going with with, with one of those uh, duos, that uh, they could have they could again have a pretty good year this year. I think that offense is similar to Auburn's in that I can't decide whether or not Franks and one of those wide receivers you mentioned are more important than Franks and one of the running backs in the run game. Because, as we know, that's what Dan Mullen wants to do. Uh, And we saw Felipe Franks take some positive steps in the run game. I thought as much as anything, he he improved as a passer, but I think he helped himself hang on to that job more so by what we saw from him on the ground as the season wore on. And I feel the same way about Auburn. You know, I look at Bo Nix, Joey Gatewood. Is it one of those guys with, say, a Seth Williams on the outside, or is it more one of those guys with Booby Whitlow or one of the other running backs? I'm not, and I think you could throw in there, Trav, if one of those quarterbacks hooks up with Schwartz with his yep. speed on the outside, um, that could certainly be dangerous. Schwartz is a just a, just a real track star in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, but but I I'm with you. That the the uh, for and I and I think um, even though the quarterbacks will get a lot of the attention when Auburn goes to Gainesville in October, uh, I think that I think the team that runs the ball probably wins that game. Yeah, both teams are going to try to do a lot of the same things on the offensive side anyway. Um, when you talk about the run game first and foremost and the potential for quarterbacks for both teams to make big plays with their legs in that game. But, uh, yeah, it, it, you're still going to need some help from those guys on the outside. And, you know, it's interesting because we've seen so much about facilities in the news here in the last week, what LSU did uh, with its locker room specifically. And that setup certainly made waves around college football. We know Florida is undergoing uh, construction of or plans of an $85 million standalone facility, which is probably a decade late when you look around the rest of the SEC. Um, You know, and, and that got me to thinking about Dan Mullen. And I said this on the show yesterday. Dan Mullen left a better football facility at Mississippi State than the one he inherited at Florida. Now, Florida is rectifying that situation, as we just outlined, with the the new standalone facility. But where a guy like Dan Mullen sees the bigger picture is that he'll have a roster or he anticipates having a roster at the University of Florida, Brent, more conducive to winning championships because player, let's say, 21 through about 60 on his roster at Florida – should be of better quality than 21 through 60 that he had at Mississippi State. And I think the 2014 season was an illustration of that because Mississippi State's first 25 or so that year, they could line up with pretty much anybody in the country. As we saw, Mississippi State went to number one in the polls. But as far as a more complete roster, that has to be 
what he's thinking in terms of the long term and the ability to vie for championships legitimately on an annual basis, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any question, Travis, and that's really where you win championships. Uh, it, it would be on these rosters, and, and look, I I think there's times that you could hone in uh, and and say, um, and when I talk about rosters a lot. What, what I'm talking about, and I think you are too, is probably the top 50 players, frankly. And, and oftentimes, Trav, the, the Alabamas and the Clemsons, they're, they're, they're 40 through 50 is better than anybody else's. So uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt that's what he's trying to do. And, and see, to their credit this year, I mean, they've got, unlike many teams, i.e. Georgia, at quarterback, I mean, you've got Franks, and you've got Emory Jones, and you've got Kyle Trask, who proved last year that even Trask, before he got hurt, it, look, listen, Trask was very close to taking that job before he got hurt. So you've got depth at quarterback. You've got depth at running back with DeMichael P. Ryan and Malik Davis, among others. And and then this, Trav, this wide receiver core they've got, could you argue that this is the best receiver core they've had probably since Urban was there uh, yeah. as far as being productive? So, uh, you know, your point's well taken because if you if you can go three or four deep at these positions, at that point you're getting that roster on what, uh, uh, 21 through 50, aren't you? November is what separates – pretenders and contenders yep. and if you don't have the roster built for that hall it will show up in november just like it did for mississippi state in 2014 um when that team was in position and played alabama extremely tough right here in tuscaloosa yep. and if you were in the stadium that day that had the environment the electricity of an alabama lsu and alabama auburn uh and that certainly was the pinnacle of mississippi state football under Dan Mullen uh, you mentioned I'm fascinated by that August 24th matchup of Florida and Miami but Brent we got another big one that day right Arizona right. travels to Oahu to take on our Rainbow Warriors don't forget about that one uh, well, uh, absolutely not and <laughs> the, the interesting thing about that uh, is going to be too is can that uh, can that Arizona team with one Kevin Sumlin, Trev, they've got to be better in year two under Kevin than year one, don't they? Yeah, they should be, but they were still good enough last year to roll Mario Cristobal and the Oregon Ducks yeah. by about 30. And that's that's the game when everybody tries to sell me on Oregon for this season. And the reason why I'm already on record picking Auburn to beat Oregon in the season opener is I can't get Oregon laying that duck egg Right. Uh, in Tucson from a year ago. That was a bad Arizona team. It was. It and you was. go there and, and lose and the, by they were 30. They as functional as they could be yeah. in, in, in his first year. Uh, now, now, look, I know that Oregon returns on their offensive line the most starts of any offensive line in the nation, and I can appreciate that. But, Trav, I still don't think that's good enough to beat the Auburn defensive line on a consistent basis. Now, Justin Herbert may be uh, – he may be able to cover a multitude of sins there, but I'm with you on that. The, the closer I look at that thing, uh, it's still I, – I, look, I, I, I don't care if it's uh, 2019 or if it's 2039, you're going to win with that line of scrimmage, and Auburn's got a better line of scrimmage. I think it's going to be similar to last year's opener in Atlanta when Auburn faced Washington from the Pac-12. I think it's going to be that kind of game in Arlington, Texas. I like Auburn already uh, to win that one over the Ducks of Oregon. Now, you note here, and it was a storyline from last week in Hoover, Brent, kind of the year the the transfer quarterback in the Southeastern Conference, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And, and I know we don't talk much about them, but, but listen, that – that Arkansas situation to me is is interesting with with Hicks coming over from SMU with Chad Morris and then Nick Starkle who is there too. Uh, that that's a pretty interesting battle. But but uh, to me the the real interesting battle is all is obviously Tommy Stevens and Keontae Thompson uh, in, in in this situation. Trev, as athletic as Thompson is. 
if he doesn't win that job, do they try to do something else with him just to get him on the field at different times? I could see that. And in talking with Matt Wyatt, our friend of the program here, who is your your analyst on Mississippi State radio broadcast, former Mississippi State quarterback, and talking with Matt on the show from Hoover a week ago today, I got the sense that uh, Matt Wyatt believes it is going to be Tommy Stevens. Um, that that's going to end up being the guy behind center for Mississippi State. That does bring about some potentially interesting scenarios for Keaton Thompson, a very good athlete, similar to Nick uh, uh, Fitzgerald from that standpoint from the last few years. Arkansas is very fascinating because I, I, I'll give it to Nick Starkle. I would be a little bit concerned about going into a situation where a former player is hooking up with his former coach, reuniting um, with with Chad Morris there in Arkansas. When you talk about Ben Hicks coming down from Dallas, coming over from Dallas to to sort of try to solidify that job in in, uh, in Fayetteville, but uh, you know, I still tend to think there will be an opportunity for Nick Starkle during the 2019 season. Yeah, Starkles, I, I, I really is a pretty steady quarterback. I, I, you know, is he Kellen Mond? No, but but I mean, he could be. Uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't be shocked, frankly, if he even won the job. But but my 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 question for for Starkle or Hicks is. Uh, and, and I know you've seen it up close. Can that offensive line protect either one of them at Arkansas? Yeah, the, a lot of I wouldn't say love for Arkansas this preseason, but certainly after taking the bagel in SEC play in year one under Chad Morris, expectations that you know Arkansas could string together a couple of three wins in the league, be maybe a six-win team uh, based largely on schedule. Uh, but I'm not at the point with Arkansas yet, based on what we saw a year ago, where I think you can say this team is a sure thing to beat even a Colorado State right. from the non-conference. So uh, there's still a lot of things we got to see play out with this Arkansas team uh, before we buy in entirely uh, with the Chad Morris regime. Hey, uh, Brent, wanted to talk to you today about some duets around the SEC, maybe some of your top one, two punches on teams around the league. Uh, you talk about Alabama with Tua Tiger Bailoa, Jerry Judy coming back. We outlined a number of potential duets for this Alabama team on both sides of the ball. Maybe the one that Alabama <laughs> needs to step forward the most would be Skylar DeLong and Joseph Bulovis or Will Reichard. <laughs> But, you know, give us some some of those. And, and, and again, we touched on some of them with with Auburn and uh, Florida earlier. But but maybe some others, say Tennessee, South Carolina, I guess, with Jake Bentley and Brian Edwards back at wide receiver. Some of those one two punches from around the Southeastern Conference for the upcoming season. And uh, and before I let it go here, I, I think I think Anthony Jennings and, and uh, Dylan Moses. Uh, I, I, listen, I think you could come up with, uh, frankly, uh, two or three uh, of the uh, of the Alabama situations uh, there. As I think, I don't know if he may if he may would look at it this way, but Trev, I still think this Georgia offensive line with Pittman. Is is one of the best uh, anywhere, and I think you could choose some of these guys. I mean, Isaiah Wilson, uh, uh, Solomon uh, Kinley, Andrew Thomas. Uh, yeah. uh, that uh, that I don't know if that line's getting the credit it deserves. There's some pretty nasty combinations out of Georgia offensive line. Yeah, I think when you look at Georgia, you think Jake Fromm. And uh, and Swift um, there at, at, in the backfield, but you're right. You could choose the tackle tandem at Georgia, similar to you could choose the tackle tandem at Alabama. The interior tandem uh, that should be a a top two or three offensive line in all of college football, not just. Uh, when you talk about SEC units, uh, you can go nationwide with that group that Sam Pittman brings back for 2019. We're talking with Brent Beard of College Sports Today and First Coast News 
on Southern Fried Sports, presented by Peter Brook Chocolatier. Brent, as we wind down with you here, any surprises for you last week in terms of the media poll, Eastern Division predictions, uh, the the Western Division breakdown, um, you know, and the overall champ? Did that go about the way you expected? Well, I think the two teams that emerged over the last few months that that we saw the vote was one uh, Missouri now is clearly the third place team in the East, or at least that's the perception. There's a little bit of talk: could South Carolina grab that, or Kentucky? But but but, but no, Missouri with their schedule, that that's what they've come up to be. And and also this this LSU situation. I think the schedules canceled out. A&M and Auburn for second place behind Bama, so LSU has emerged uh, in in that situation too. So um, a lot of a lot of distrust right now with Kentucky after losing the players they've they've done, including Josh Allen, who obviously is down here, and Benny Snell Jr. So uh, I, I would say. Um, Missouri three and LSU two. Uh, we we kind of had a, an idea that might happen, and then it kind of solidified. But and as far as the coaches, real quick, to me the confidence, or maybe he just came out swinging and, and wanted to uh, trying to make a statement. I, I was surprised with Gus Malzahn in the print room because he really came out to say he thinks this could be a championship team, uh, frankly. So uh, I, I'm, I'm obviously we have questions about how that would play out. But his confidence there, instead of poor mouthing, surprised me just a little bit. Call me a sucker, but I'm, I'm, I'm buying Auburn. And the only thing really holding me back is that daunting schedule. As yes. we talked about many, many times, the opener with Oregon, a game that I don't think people are going to talk about enough until it really gets here on us will be when Auburn goes to College Station. You mentioned Auburn has to go to Florida uh, this time around as the cross-divisional opponent in October. There's that one-two, uh, you know, double-barreled approach of Georgia and Alabama. But if Auburn can get to mid-November – early to mid-November, even with just two losses and have those two games uh, in front of it at home with Georgia and Alabama, I think there's a chance the Tigers are once again at least playing for the opportunity to go to Atlanta as the SEC Western Division champion. Not picking Auburn to win either or both those games, uh, but I, I think I think Gus's Gus's energy, juice, pop, enthusiasm, optimism, whatever you want to call it, is because he returns that offensive line intact. He's got a couple of quarterbacks that he feels like he can insert into that run game first and foremost, get back to what Auburn is really best at when they're really good. Um, And then the defensive front. He feels good about his lines of scrimmage, as he should, although that offensive line didn't really play to that standard a year ago. Um, and, and I think he's higher on his quarterbacks than maybe a lot of people are. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. And, and, and again, I'm with you on Oregon, but, but, but Travis, I think much more important for them uh, is, and I know they've got a break in between, but at A&M, Mississippi State at home, and then at Florida, Trav, does that determine the season? Yeah, that's a gauntlet right there. No doubt about it. Um, I know you've also seen here in the last day or so, Georgia Notre Dame set for prime time on September the 21st. Looking at some of the secondary market ticket prices, we talk about ticket concerns, ticket sales, and things like that in college football these days. Uh, There's still some of these matchups where the ticket man uh, can pretty much do okay for the rest of the season, and Georgia Notre Dame uh, in prime time on September the 21st certainly has a look at that kind of game. Well, and, and listen, one of the reasons that that game has the magnitude that it does, some of the, uh, we're talking to some of the Georgia beat writers, and one of them who I trust said the reason that game is so anticipated, and, and he thinks it may be the most anticipated game uh, in Georgia history was was a term he used, 
uh, is that, that there's a real thought that uh, even with the home and homes going on, uh, that this may be the only time uh, that Notre Dame uh, in our lifetime trap comes to Athens. So uh, the, no, no doubt that, that for a variety of reasons, why well, that game uh, is looked on now is with importance that it has. Yeah, there was a time when Notre Dame probably could have demanded that a game like that be played at Mercedes-Benz Stadium yeah. Yeah. in Atlanta rather than on campus. But uh, you're right, that takes it to another level with the Fighting Irish uh, visiting Athens. And it looks like, Brent, for the first time since 2010, we're on track for an Alabama-LSU game that at least kicks off underneath <laughs> the afternoon sun. Well, of course, by night, by the time by the time the game is over, it, it will be night at that point. But yeah, that that that's rather interesting. And, and a lot of national guys have said this week that even though it is a tremendous rivalry, and I still think that. Uh, there's some folks in that football building who consider it to be their big, their biggest rivalry of the year. Uh, that that Bama's taking a lot of the sting out of that rivalry because of the winning streak they're on now. No doubt about it. And what's interesting to me is we talk about ticket prices and you know those type of things with Georgia and Notre Dame. You think back to that 2011 game, and and there were games in that in that stretch. 2008 wasn't a cheap ticket in Baton Rouge with Saban going back to LSU for the first time. Uh, 2009 in Tuscaloosa was a high demand ticket. 2011, though, you know, what was deemed that year, that year's game of the century anyway, you would pay more. You paid more on the secondary market back then just to get in the stadium at yeah. Bryant Denny in 2011 than. You can pay right now today for a four-game pack of tickets to Alabama football. That includes LSU. You can go to RollTide.com right now. 260 bucks. you can get four games right now, Brent, and one yeah. of them is LSU. I think that tells you as much as anything where we've kind of traveled with uh, ticket demand and, and fan attendance, right? Uh, uh, well, in, in Travis, these athletic directors are having to pay attention to this. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if it was so much the uh, uh, the talk from the podium, but it was certainly the, the hall talk, was it not, that that they're going to have to this, – this is a different day uh, at, at that point. And I remember being at that game, and one of the only games I've ever been at that, that uh, it was like, the game was being played during warm up so it was just absolutely amazing but uh, but, but now it shows you how the, how these things have changed and, and, and listen the, the, this this package deal thing of whatever whatever they're going to do three games four games or whatever we see this pop up at Tennessee uh, yeah. at Florida State at Alabama where, where we were, listen we would have laughed at that when we tried five and ten years ago or certainly fifteen and said that would have never Happened. Yeah, if you were outside Bryant Denny in the evening to early nighttime hours uh, that November day uh, when LSU came to town, you would have absolutely laughed in my face if I'd have told you, "Look, in eight years, you're going to be able to purchase a four-game package <laughs> for two hundred and sixty dollars that will get you into either Ole Miss or Arkansas, yep. New Mexico State." Western Carolina and LSU yeah. because I can promise you my my memory my recollection anyway of that game here in Tuscaloosa eight years ago was that the cheapest get in was more than two hundred and sixty dollars yeah. yeah. per no ticket. Doubt. Uh, outside the stadium but, and but, also but, but these guys realize these ADs realize Travis and that, that old saying some money is better than no money uh, and, and look I, I, it's going to be very interesting to see where we go and what uh, even five years from now uh, with this attendance trend going the way it is yeah well, the problem that the ADs and uh, you know the conferences have is that Everyone basically has the equivalence of their own skybox these days, yes. and it, and it's uh, it, it's it's at home. You know, it, it's not at the stadium, and uh, you know, 
Nick Saban has a pretty good idea on how to sort of rectify some of this, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and although I don't think it would be a total fix, I still think there'd be plenty of people that stay at home. You go to 10 conference games and schedule mm-hmm. more home and homes, I think you might get more people out to the ballpark. What do you think? Yeah, well, look, I don't think there's any question about that. And, and, and that's why there's going to be a slow process in this league. But, but we're beginning to see more coaches come around to that. And, and it still may be, what, uh, five, seven, maybe even ten years before everybody agrees to do it. But but, but at some point, uh, it, uh, listen, there's no question. Uh, Alabama and Florida uh, uh, are in, in mid-September is going to sell a few more ticks and have a lot more interest than Alabama and Western Carolina. You know, when Alabama and Saban first proposed, I believe it was nine games, uh, a a nine-game SEC schedule, the vote against it was 13 to 1. Of course, Alabama was the lone vote. I'll say this for Gus Malzahn in Auburn, though. Uh, The next time it was presented, uh, it was 12 to 2. Gus Malzahn jumped on board, interestingly enough, uh, with Nick Saban there, uh, sort of the Iron Bowl duo trying to make it happen. We'll see how that goes in the coming years. Well, Brent, as always, great stuff. Always great to have you here on the program. Look forward to all of your great work there on College Sports Today, which you can see on Facebook Live, and also with First Coast News down in Jacksonville, Florida. Thanks a lot, Brent. My pleasure, pal. Take care.